glad to be here this month. And uh, as we sort of on the glide slope to the uh, con concluding our year here, we have this presentation by Bob and then uh, Paul is gonna do one in May. And then that's about, <clears throat> that'll be the end of our presentations for the year. So uh, I think it's been a really good year. And along with that, I, I didn't catch the live presentation of Cindy's talk on Verina Davis last month, but I did use for the first time our uh, new feature with uh, Elise has set up to watch the recording on our website. So uh, it was a really excellent presentation, particularly for somebody doing it for the first time on Zoom. So I appreciate Cindy making the effort to go ahead and do that. And uh, also, if you haven't used the uh, recording or going on and checked out the recording feature, go ahead and do that. And uh, also, you know, another thing that can be used for if you're a presenter and you have some courage, you can go in and listen to yourself. It does take some courage because I remember when, when I first started out doing trials, I heard myself on the recording and couldn't believe that was the same person that I envisioned how I heard myself to hear. But you can learn a lot and you can improve yourself if you have enough courage to watch yourself. So um, with that, I'll go ahead and uh, turn it over to Gene and he can introduce our uh, speaker, Bob Pressman, Pressman who's doing this for the second time, he was, this is a follow on to what he did for us last year. So go ahead, Gene. All right, thank you very much. And first off, I'd like to uh, echo a little bit of what our president said and, and uh, do a shout out for Elise. Um, you've done a marvelous job on the, uh, the tech hosting and you may have a future as a teacher because I think you've, <laughs> I think you've done well teaching some of us how to use this goofy stuff called Zoom. So thank you so much for all of that. Um, as, as our president indicated, um, this is round two with, uh, with Bob. Bob uh, did a great job of challenging us and uh, with some myths and or facts uh, from, uh, uh, from the Civil War. And uh, he's got some more good stuff for us today. And because I'm suffering from allergies, and we'll probably cough in your face. I'm gonna keep it short. So Bob, I'll turn it over to you. And thanks again for being a presenter. Okay, well, thank you very much, Jane. Also, thank you, Elise, uh, especially for your uh, technology help. And thank you ha for having me back for another presentation about the Civil War. Now, the past several years have really dramatized the impact the Civil War and Reconstruction still have on our society today. And the parallels are just astounding. But as much as I hear people talk about how divided our country is today, it doesn't come anywhere close to the divisions we had in 1860. And the myths surrounding the Civil War are astronomical. Now, why is that? Well, from the moment the Civil War ended until the present day, there's been a concerted effort to rewrite and reframe history in order to redeem the South to make slavery seem righteous and a benefit to the enslaved, to glorify the cause and the battles, to make us forget the horrors of more than 700,000 deaths. Now in the aftermath of the Civil War and Reconstruction, writers, filmmakers, and politicians, all sympathetic to the Confederacy, inundated our culture with false narratives about what had happened just a short time before, and it worked. And one bright spot is today we're finally re-examining what happened and dispelling many of those myths. And I think we're finally coming to grips with our own history. Now, today I'll be presenting four statements concerning the Civil War. And I'll ask you to consider whether each statement is a fact or a myth. Then I'll show you what current historians have to say and what the hard evidence tells us. Now, normally this presentation takes about an hour and a half. So I have edited it down. I'll move very quickly through two of the statements, but I'll spend more time on the other two that have really become very controversial in recent years. And uh, as Elise mentioned, I'll answer questions at the end of the presentation. While I'm giving it, you can use that chat feature at the bottom of your screen. So let's get started. Our first statement. The North won the Civil War by waging total war with brutality against civilians and enemy soldiers alike while the South treated non-combatants and POWs with respect. Do you think this is a fact or do you think it's a myth? Well, this is a myth. 
And this is a favorite one of Southern revisionists. It tries to show the South as being morally superior to the North. And it really that's kind of ironic when you consider the South fought the war to preserve slavery. Of course, that was the purpose to deflect criticism of the South and focus on the North. Now there's no question that as in all wars, there were crimes against humanity committed by both sides, but there was no plan by the North to brutalize Southerners. Now the main allegations uh, of brutality were made against Generals U U Ulysses S. Grant and William T. Sherman. So first let's take a look at Grant. Some Southern historians refer to Grant as a butcher, ruthless, a cold-blooded killer. Nothing could be further from the truth. This is from the book Grant by Ron Chernow. Great. The caricature of Grant as a filthy butcher is ironic for a man who could not stomach the sight of blood, studiously refrained from romanticizing warfare and shied away from a military career. If Grant never shrank from sending masses of soldiers into bloody battles, it had nothing to do with a heartless disregard for human life and everything to do with bringing the war to a speedy conclusion. And look at how Grant treated, uh, or I should say accepted Robert E. Lee's surrender at Appomattox Courthouse. Grant treated Lee and his troops with dignity and respect. Now as for Sherman, Southern revisionists describe his march from Atlanta to the sea as barbaric, raping and pillaging without any purpose. Well, this was a gross exaggeration. While Sherman's army did destroy anything they felt could help the Confederate army, it did not. It did not commit wanton rape and murder of civilians. Uh, this is from the book Confederates in the Attic by Tony Horwitz, and I would highly recommend this book. It's, it's a terrific read. Sherman talked a good game, pledging to make Georgia howl, but the reality of his march rarely matched his words. One Georgia geographer had painstakingly mapped the march route and found that many homes alleged to have been burned were in fact still standing. The actual destruction of private dwellings, he concluded, was rare indeed. Nor was Sherman's march, which caused few civilian deaths, notably cruel by historic standards. Well, let's take a look at the other side of this issue, the behavior of the South. This is from the book, The Myth of the Lost Cause by Edward H. Bone Kemper III. Most of the killings of civilians during the Civil War occurred in Missouri, Kansas, the Appalachian sections of many Confederate states, and Texas. They were generally carried out by civilians engaged in guerrilla warfare and not by organized military units. In Missouri, William Quantrill and Bloody Bill Anderson committed some of the worst atrocities of the war. You see uh, their pictures here on their wanted posters. They led their homegrown militias in support of the Confederacy. Now you also have Andersonville prison in Georgia where almost 13,000 captured Northern troops died from the deplorable conditions there. Now, Captain Henry Wirtz was the commandant at Andersonville. He was the only person tried and executed for war crimes from the Civil War. You also have Confederate General Nathan Bedford Forrest, who oversaw the cold-blooded execution of unarmed Black Union soldiers after those soldiers had surrendered at Fort Pillow. Now, this is a famous picture of Richmond, Virginia and ruins at the end of the war. And this has been used to illustrate the wanton destruction imposed by the North. In reality, though, most of the damage was done by the Confederates. In evacuating the city, they set fire to tobacco warehouses. Those fires then spread throughout Richmond. It resulted in nine tenths of the business district being destroyed. Now again, there were atrocities committed by both sides in the Civil War as in all wars, but the North was certainly no worse than the South in that regard, and in some instances acquitted itself more honorably. Let's move on to our next statement. Shortly after the Civil War, the South built statues and monuments to honor the skill and bravery of their generals and leaders. Do you think this is a fact or you think it's a myth? Well, this is a myth. And this is an issue that's caused considerable controversy and protest over the past several years. The most notable being in Charlottesville, Virginia in 2017 over the statue of Robert E. Lee, which you see right here. I'm gonna spend some time on this because it's been so controversial. Now let's take a look at the facts. To begin with, 
the vast majority of monuments and statues raised by the South were not, were not constructed shortly after the Civil War. And the two decades after the Civil War, a number of monuments were built with almost all of them being placed in cemeteries as a way of remembering the dead. The big increase in monument and statue building started around 1890 with the rise of the Jim Crow laws in the South. And most of those statues and monuments were placed in public town squares. They wanted to be very visible. And there was another big spike in the 1950s and 60s during the civil rights movement. Now in reaction to the protest in Charlottesville, our recent president took sides in the controversy. I have a video from the General Interest News website Vox, which illustrates the timeline of these monuments and includes some of the comments from our recent president. Let's take a look. Many of those people were there to protest the taking down of the statue of Robert E. Lee. So this week it's Robert E. Lee. I noticed that Stonewall Jackson's coming down. I wonder, is it George Washington next week? And is it Thomas Jefferson the week after? You know, you, all, you really do have to ask yourself, where does it stop? The Confederate monuments President Trump mentions are more than innocent markers of American history. Many exist to celebrate the Confederate cause to preserve the rights of whites over minorities. These monuments can be traced back to the Civil War. But most of the sites and symbols were actually created during periods of racial conflict long after the Civil War. The Southern Poverty Law Center compiled at least 1,503 Confederate symbols in public space. Each dot on this timeline represents a monument, a symbol, or an icon. Some represent statues. Others are names of schools, parks, or military bases. The chart starts with the Civil War, when the monuments first show up. Then in 1866, there's a rise that coincides with the formation of the Ku Klux Klan. But the chart reveals a significant rise in the creation of these monuments in two periods. The first is in the early 1900s, when ex-Confederate states in the South enacted Jim Crow laws. The response from this period is clear. The NAACP was founded during this peak. And the spike continues to the 1920s, which were marked by the re-emergence of the KKK. The next cluster of Confederate monuments were built in the 1950s and 60s. Construction of the symbols spiked in 1965, the 100th year anniversary of the end of the Civil War. During this modern civil rights movement until 1970, it became more common for schools to be named after Confederate proponents. And it didn't stop there. A movement to erase these symbols of Confederate ideology has recently surfaced across the country. These statues are not just stone and metal. They're not just innocent remembrances of a benign history. These monuments celebrate a fictional sanitized confederacy, ignoring the death, ignoring the enslavement, ignoring the terror that it actually stood for. Critics of that movement equate these monuments with Southern pride, white heritage, and culture. But the fact that a vast majority of the monuments were constructed during racial conflict reveals the opposite. They honor the confederacy and the racism that it stood for. Now, what did Robert E. Lee himself say about building monuments to the Confederacy? This is what Lee said in 1869. I think it wiser not to keep open the sores of war, follow the examples of those nations who endeavored to obliterate the marks of civil strife. The next question would be, who exactly put up these monuments? Well, the main force behind the erection of these memorials and monuments is an organization called the United Daughters of the Confederacy, or the UDC for short. The UDC was founded in 1894 in Nashville, Tennessee, for the female descendants of Confederate soldiers and political leaders, and those who supported the South during the Civil War. At its height, its membership stood at about 100,000. This was during World War I. And this organization is still active today. The UDC is currently based in Richmond, Virginia, and in the year 2000, its then president estimated there were 25,000 members across 700 chapters in 32 states. Its membership today is believed to be around 20,000. Now, what you see here is a picture of one of those chapters, the Waynesboro, Georgia chapter from around 1900. And this is from the book Race and Reunion, The Civil War in American Memory. The author is David Blight. 
Referring to the United Daughters of the Confederacy, Blight writes, they were activists eager to fight to control America's memory of slavery, the Civil War, and Reconstruction. They delivered public speeches, wrote in the popular press, and lobbied congressmen. On a popular level, they may have accomplished more than professional historians in laying down for decades a conception of a victimized South, fighting nobly for high constitutional principles, and defending a civilization of benevolent white masters and contented African slaves. Now, Blight goes on to say, the generally well-heeled UDC women were strikingly successful at raising money to build Confederate monuments, lobbying legislatures in Congress for the reburial of Confederate dead, and working to shape the content of history books. In all their efforts, the UDC planted a white supremacist vision of the lost cause deeper into the nation's imagination than perhaps any other association. And what you're seeing now is actually a current chapter of the UDC, the Jeb Stewart chapter in Fayetteville, North Carolina. This is actually taken from their Facebook page. Now, this is a statue of Confederate Cavalry General Jeb Stewart on what's called Monument Avenue in Richmond, Virginia. Now, let's take a look at what other historians have to say about this issue. This is from an article on the History website. It's entitled, How the U.S. Got So Many Confederate Monuments. The author is Becky Little. The vast majority of them were built between the 1890s and 1950s, which matches up with the era of Jim Crow segregation. All of those monuments were there to teach values to people, according to Mark Elliott, a history professor at the University of North Carolina, Greensboro. That's why they put them in city schools. That's why they put them in front of state buildings. The values those monuments stood for included a glorification of the cause of the Civil War. Uh, the American Historical Association is the largest organization of professional historians in the world. It put out this statement after the riot in Charlottesville, Virginia in August 2017. Now, that statement reads in part, the bulk of the monument building took place not in the aftermath of the Civil War, but from the close of the 19th century into the second decade of the 20th commemorating not just the Confederacy, but also the redemption of the South after Reconstruction, this enterprise was part and parcel of the initiation of legally mandated segregation and widespread disenfranchisement across the South. Memorials to the Confederacy were intended in part to obscure the terrorism required to overthrow Reconstruction and to intimidate African-Americans politically and to isolate them from the mainstream of public life. Now, more than 20 other historical associations have endorsed that statement. Now, this is a picture of the Stonewall Jackson statue, again on Monument Avenue in Richmond, Virginia. And this is a picture of the Robert E. Lee statue on Monument Avenue. And it's interesting, the great-great-grandsons of both Jackson and Lee have called for the statues of Lee and Jackson in Richmond to be taken down. Now, this is a picture of the statue of Confederate General Nathan Bedford Forrest, erected in Memphis, Tennessee in 1905. Now, this statue has also been controversial. It was removed in December 2017 after a long legal and legislative debate in Memphis. Now, why is this statue so controversial? Well, as shown uh, before, Nathan Bedford Forrest, while being an excellent cavalry general, was also a founder and the first Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. In addition, he oversaw the slaughter of unarmed Black Union troops after they surrendered at the Battle of Fort Pillow in April 1864. Do you really want to honor this guy? Now, this is another statue of Nathan Bedford Forrest, this one erected in Nashville, Tennessee in 1998, not that long ago. But this is a statue that some say should remain since it makes Forrest look so ridiculous with those beady eyes and that weird expression. It has been called, this statue has been called the Confederacy's dumbest monument, and it's been listed as one of the 10 most bizarre public sculptures. And what's considered to be the largest memorial to the Confederacy is this monument. It's built on the side of Stone Mountain in Georgia. It depicts Stonewall Jackson, Robert E. Lee, and Jefferson Davis on horseback and it's actually bigger than Mount Rushmore. 
Now, the project to build this started in 1915. It was expected to be finished in no more than 12 years. And the original sculptor was the same one who later carved Mount Rushmore. Uh, but this project was not completed until 1972. Now, it looks innocent enough, just honoring three icons of the Confederacy. But as usual, that is not the whole story. Stone Mountain was chosen as, as the site for this memorial because it is the birthplace of the modern Ku Klux Klan, the Klan that still exists today. Now, there was one proposed monument that was extremely controversial at the time and did not get built. In 1923, the United Builders of the Confederacy lobbied Congress for funds for tax dollars to build a monument to black mammies. The Senate appropriated $200,000 for the project, but the bill failed in the House largely because of the outrage expressed by Black women. This is from The Almost Monument to Black Mammies by Allison M. Parker. It's a column from the New York Times from February 9th, 2020, a little over a year ago. But African-American club women and reformers did not accept the mammy stereotype. Many were the daughters and granddaughters of enslaved women who had been forced to work as caretakers of other women's children. They quickly mobilized and led their African-American allies in the NAACP and the Black press to fight against the proposed monument through letters to the editor. Now, there were other monuments built that did include mammies, as you see in this picture. Now, the video shown earlier talks about memorials to the Confederacy other than monuments. And I find it simply incredible that today we still have U.S. military bases that are named after Confederate generals. Uh, here's a list of those bases in chronological order from when they were built. You can see the first four were built and named in that period that most of the monuments were built. The other six were put up during World War II. Consider that these forts were named after generals who fought against the United States. And many of them, as I'm sure most of you know, were mediocre at best. Now, now there's been a movement to rename those forts but the army has said it will not do so. The last word on the subject, I'll leave to historian Eric Foner. This is from an interview with the History News Network. Foner was asked about the Robert E. Lee statue in Charlottesville, Virginia, which you see right here. This is what Foner had to say. The key thing to remember about this statue and most of these statues is that they have very little to do with the Civil War. This statue was erected in 1924, almost 70 years after the end of the Civil War. It was erected at the height of Jim Crow, the height of the era of segregation, disenfranchisement, and lynching. Like all these statues, this one was erected as a statement about who's in charge, about the power structure in society. Okay, let's move on to our next statement. Robert E. Lee was one of the greatest generals in the history of the United States. You think this is a fact? Or do you think it's a myth? Well, this is a myth. And, and this is a statement, though, that continues to be hotly debated, even among today's historians. And there are points to be made on both sides. But consider the statement. Robert E. Lee had his impressive victories in individual battles. He was certainly one of the South's better generals. But that does not mean he was one of the greatest generals in US history. His record actually is very uneven. After graduating second in his class at West Point, Lee distinguishes himself in the war with Mexico and in suppressing John Brown's raid at Harper's Ferry. When the Civil War breaks out, Lee is offered command of the Union Army, but he turns it down and instead joins the Confederacy where the governor of Virginia assigns him to lead Virginia's forces. Now, initially, Lee fails. He loses the Battle of Cheat Mountain and is relieved of his command. Not very good for Lee. But Lee does get a second chance. In May 1862, General Joseph E. Johnston is severely wounded, and Lee is appointed to take his place as the, at the head of the Army of Northern Virginia. He gets significant victories in the Seven Days Battle and at Second Bull Run. His troops love him. Very good for Lee. In September 1862, Lee decides to invade the North. He hopes to win a decisive battle that will help bring England and France to side with the Confederacy. Big strategic mistake. The Battle of Antietam in Maryland becomes the bloodiest day in US history. It forces Lee to pull his troops back to the South 
and allows President Abraham Lincoln to issue his preliminary Emancipation Proclamation. Not good at all. Lee recovers, though. He gets major victories at Fredericksburg and Chancellorsville. But not having learned his lesson at Antietam, Lee invades the North again, this time suffering a critical loss at Gettysburg, where he ignores the advice of his second in command, General James Longstreet, Lee deciding to stand and fight at Gettysburg. The Army of Northern Virginia is decimated. Very bad for Lee. Now, because of his loss of manpower, Lee is now forced to fight a defensive war, which many historians feel he should have been fighting all along. And initially, Lee does remarkably well here with victories at the Wilderness and at Cold Harbor, but Grant's numerical advantage is eventually too much, leading to the fall of Petersburg and Richmond, and finally to Lee's surrender at Appomattox Courthouse in Virginia. So what you have here is a very inconsistent military record, both good and bad. So why do so many historians regard Lee as a great general? How did this come about? Well, Southern historians, Southern writers, and Southern redemption groups, including the United Daughters of the Confederacy, all combined to make Robert E. Lee the mythical icon of the Confederacy. And the key figure here is one Douglas Southall Freeman. Freeman wrote a four-volume Pulitzer Prize-winning biography of Lee. It was published in 1934 and 1935. It was considered for decades to be the definitive study of Robert E. Lee. And in this, Southall deifies Lee. This is from the book, The Myth of the Lost Cause by Edward Bone Kemper. A pioneer analyst was T. Harry Williams, who in 1955 began questioning the myths surrounding Lee in a short and shocking Journal of Southern History article on Lee. The general's biographer, Douglas Southall Freeman, wrote Williams, came close to arguing that whatever Lee did was right because he was Lee. Freeman was more like the little girl in Richmond who came home from Sunday school and said, Mama, I can't remember. Was General Lee in the Old Testament or the New Testament? <laughs> now, in the myth of the lost cause, Bone Kemper also lists the shortcomings of Lee. Among them, overaggressiveness, loss of battlefield control, one theater myopia, Lee was only concerned about Virginia and the Army of Northern Virginia, not what was going on with the rest of the war. Inadequate staff, complex and uncoordinated battle plans, Gettysburg is an example of that, poor orders, and senseless continuation of the war. Lee probably could have surrendered five months before he did after the fall of Atlanta and, the, and Savannah and Mobile. Instead, he fought on and it resulted in really thousands of needless deaths. So overall, I'd say Robert E. Lee was a very good tactical commander who won battles against inferior Northern generals, but he did not understand the general strategy for the South to be able to win the Civil War. You can even make the argument that Robert E. Lee was one of the reasons, not the main reason, but one of the many reasons the South lost the Civil War. We move on to our next statement, and we'll spend a little time on this too. Uh, on the whole, slaves were happy and content with their lot in life and loyal to their masters before and during the Civil War. You think this is a fact, or do you think it's a myth? Well, to me, this is pretty obviously a myth. And uh, it's interesting, in the last uh, several years, I've come across people who, who really do believe this. I did a Civil War presentation a few years ago in Chicago, and one of the people attending asked a very pointed question. He asked, uh, weren't the slaves better off being slaves in America as opposed to having stayed and lived back in their home country in Africa? Also, this was recently a, a friend of mine mentioned that a friend of his made the statement to him that uh, really slavery wasn't all that bad. After all, the slaves were fed and clothed. So those feelings still exist today. And once again, this is one of those myths propagated by Southern historians and redeemers of the Old South. But if this myth is to be believed, there are a number of unanswered questions. Why did slaves seek their freedom during the Revolutionary War by joining British forces 
This was a movement that led the Virginia Assembly to issue a declaration that imposed the death penalty for runaway slaves attempting to join the British. Why were there an estimated 250 slave revolts, the most notable being the one Nat Turner led in Virginia in 1831? This is from an article on the history website entitled Slave Rebellions. Slave rebellions were a continuous source of fear in the American South. Laws dictating where, when, and how slaves could congregate were enacted to prevent insurrection and quell white paranoia. Now, after the Nat Turner Revolt, most slave states made it illegal to educate slaves, to teach them how to read and write. And this was done to make it more difficult for an organized rebellion. More questions. Why did an estimated 70,000 slaves successfully run away to free states in Canada with tens of thousands more runaways getting captured and returned to their masters? The vast majority of these runaways, by the way, were from the upper south or the border states. It was almost impossible to escape from slavery in the deep south. Why did the southern states insist on passage of the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850? Why did hundreds of thousands of slaves escape during the war and flee to Union lines? Why did some 200,000 African Americans enlist in the Union Army and Navy, about 75% of them former slaves? After the war, why did Blacks venerate President Lincoln, with many referring to him as Father Abraham? Now, all of those questions contradict the image of happy and contented slaves, but, but the South was very successful in projecting that image after the war. This is from the book Race and Reunion by David Blight. From the mid-1890s to as late as 1930, the Confederate veteran magazine published hundreds of tributes to faithful slaves, often written by their former masters. Stories of Negro devotion, of faithful servants saving their masters from wartime battlefields, of old Blacks paying tribute to their old master or mistress. Now, Blight goes on to say, Loyal slaves who never really wanted their freedom were far more prominent in the Southern imagination in 1915 than they had ever been in 1865. Lost to near oblivion and white memory by the early 20th century were the countless wartime testimonies of planters about the defections and betrayals of their most trusted slaves. Now, even uh, Confederate President Jefferson Davis perpetrated the myth of a happy, contented slave. This is what Davis wrote 20 years after the Civil War. Slaves were trained in the gentle arts of peace and order and civilization. They increased from a few unprofitable savages to millions of efficient Christian laborers. Their servile instincts rendered them contented with their lot. Their strong local and personal attachment secured faithful service to those to whom their service and labor was due. A strong mutual affection was the natural result of their lifelong relation. Never was there happier dependence of labor and capital on each other. Again, that's what Jefferson Davis said 20 years after the war. Now, it must have slipped Davis's mind that in January 1864, two of his slaves, his personal servant and his wife's maid, fled the executive mansion in Richmond. And another slave of his tried to burn down the mansion. Now, there's no question there were a handful of relatively contented slaves, mostly the household servants, but the so-called house slaves were a tiny percentage of the overall slave population, and even most of them ran to freedom during and after the war. Most slaves put on a happy face in front of their masters and they obeyed the rules. Not to do so would have resulted in torture and possibly death. Now, this is from The War Before the War by Andrew Del Banco. William Greenleaf Elliott, the founder of Washington University in St. Louis and the grandfather of T.S. Elliott, hated slavery and wrote after the Civil War, over the best and most pampered slave, the sword of uncertainty always hung, suspended by an invisible hair, from which it came to pass that under the best circumstances, the best condition of slavery was worse than the worst condition of freedom. Now, American slavery is referred to as chattel slavery. It was brutal. This is from the book, The Half Has Never Been Told, that slavery and American capitalism, the author is Edward Baptist. I highly, I highly recommend this book too. It really goes over the economics of slavery. But this is what Baptist writes. 
Many of the people who came out of the chains and off the blocks who couldn't make their way in those first few weeks in the cotton fields had lost everything, their words, their cells, even their names. Forced migration of the frontiers of slavery took children from parents who named them and taught them to talk, brothers from sisters who carried them as babies, wives from husbands who had whispered to them in the night, men from friends who had taken whippings rather than betray them. Now, I believe this last part was the worst aspect of American slavery. It was common practice from about 1830 to 1861 for plantation owners in the border and East Coast Southern states to break up families and sell some of their slaves to the deep Southern states of Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana, where cotton was thriving. Most slaves would have gladly taken a whipping rather than have their children or their spouse sold down the river, as that saying goes. That's where that expression comes from. So once again, how did this myth of the happy, contented slave become so prevalent? Well, two Southern authors, Joel Chandler Harris and Thomas Nelson Page, both widely read at the turn of the century, promoted this stereotype. And I'm sure many of you have uh, seen or read the Uncle Remus stories by Joel Chandler Harris. I know I did as a kid watching Disneyland on television. Uh, Harris's book, Uncle Remus, His Songs and His Sayings, came out in 1880, and it was wildly popular. For those who don't know, Uncle Remus was portrayed as an elderly black without a care in the world who told old folk tales about Br'er Fox and Br'er Rabbit. So here you have the caricature of the happy, contented former slave. Now, probably the worst stereotypes come from one of the most popular movies of all time. I'm sure most of you have seen Gone with the Wind. Mm -hmm. Adjusted for inflation, Gone with the Wind is the biggest box office hit of all time, grossing $3.7 billion in today's dollars. The movie is based on the best-selling novel by Margaret Mitchell, and its portrayals of Blacks fits right into the stereotypes promoted by the United Daughters of the Confederacy and other Southern Redeemers. I have a video from Turner Classic Movies. It's entitled Race in Hollywood, Gone with the Wind. It shows some of those portrayals with reaction from a Black actor, screenwriter and historian. Let's take a look. Cisco, where are you going without your shawl and not have fix to set in? And how come you didn't ask them gentlemen to stay for supper? You ain't got no more manners in the field, hands. Whatever black person says my favorite movie is Gone with the Wind, they need to sit down and talk to somebody and have their head examined. The history of the Civil War is not reflected in that movie for me anyway. The African-American audience often feels very conflicted. I mean, it can applaud the performance of Hattie McDaniel and Gone with the Wind, but we are not really being given another kind of definition of these characters. Come on in here! Come on! I remember as a child cringing every time they came on screen. Every time they came on screen. Um, whether it was Hattie McDaniel, Oscar Polk. Who's going to milk that car, Miss Scarlett? We is houseworkers. Butterfly the Queen. Oh, oh, oh. Captain Butler! Oh, Captain Butler! Captain Butler, you come out here in the streets to me! <laughs> what is it, Prissy? Miss Nelly! She done had her baby today! Every time Butterfly McQueen or some of the lesser characters of slaves had a moment on screen. Quitting time. Who says it's quitting time? I said it's quitting time. I was the foreman. I was the one who says when it's quitting time at Tara. Quitting time. It was like a fingernail going across the blackboard and, and jaws. <laughs> it, was, it was that way for me. All of them, you know, because of the roles that they played, because the characters that they played were so far away from any black person I had ever seen or had known. It wasn't until later on when Donald Bogle wrote his book and began to really analyze and put these performances in context that I began to, you know, see them in a, in a different kind of light. And I have one more video to show you. Uh, this is produced by a company called Double FaceTime, and it compares the portrayals of slaves in Gone with the Wind with the movie 12 Years a Slave. I'm sure many of you are familiar with that picture also. I'll forewarn you, though, there's some very disturbing images here. Let's take a look. Quick 
time. Who says it's quitting time? I said it's quitting time. I was the foreman. I was the one says when it's quitting time or terror. Quitting time. Quitting time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Prissy, but the army took my horse and carriage. You better come upstairs and I'll see what I can do. Oh, no, Captain Butler. Mama would wear me out with a cornstalk if I was to go into Miss Watland. <laughs> <laughs> he will strike her until her flesh is rent and meat and blood for a week or I will kill every nigger in my sight. You understand me? <laughs> come on, old gentleman. Come on. Is that all your wife? We that all your little chicks? You got no right to worry your head about believing. Come on. Now you just stand still so you can be Christmas gift for the white folks. Hold on. country twilight, the high soft negro laughter from the quarter. Convicts are dirt cheap, and if we just give Gallagher a free hand, he can... Free hand? You know what that means. He'll starve them and whip them. Didn't you see them? Some of them are sick, underfed. Oh, Ashley, how you do run on? If I let you alone, you'll be giving them chicken three times a day and tucking them to sleep with either down quilts. Scarlet, I will not make money out of the enforced labor and misery of others. You weren't so particular about owning slaves. Well, that was different. We didn't treat them that way. <laughs> Scarlet, I will not make money out of the enforced labor and misery of others. <laughs> that was different. We didn't treat them that way. <laughs> <laughs> And I'll leave it to you to decide which portrayal is the more realistic. The last word here goes to historian David White, who shows what ex-slaves had to say compared with their portrayals in white Southern literature. As Thomas Nelson Pages and Joel Chandler Harris's endearing uncles narrated story after story of slave loyalty and nostalgia for the Old South, Black survivors of slavery named the names of speculators who had sold them and their kin into a deeper South. It was America's national tragedy that the memories of slavery popularized and sold in the last decades of the 19th century were the romantic fantasies of dialect writers, not the actual remembrance of ex-slaves themselves. To this day, at the beginning of the 21st century, much of Civil War nostalgia is still rooted in the fateful memory choices made in the latter two decades of the 19th century. Let me take down my share screen now and we can uh, entertain some questions if I can figure out how to take down the share screen here. <laughs> and uh, I'm not seeing how to do this. Elise. Okay, go to the top of your screen. Yeah. And there should be a thing that says stop share or... Yeah, it's not coming up. I know what you're talking about and usually I have it up here, but now I'm not seeing it. Hmm. Well, how about view options? Uh, wait, wait, I, I'm going to take, I'm going to, how about if I close this? Give it a go. A, I think I just did it. Now yeah. Let me stop the share. And now we're good. We should be we good. We are good. good. Okay. All right. We have, um, and everybody um, still keep on mute if you don't mind. And um, if you have uh, questions or comments, let's just type them into the chat, which should be at the bottom of your screen. So we have uh, one question here. Um, this is from John. So if the statues are removed, what would you propose be done with them? Yeah, so that, that, I've been asked that question several times. It's certainly part of history. We shouldn't forget it. Uh, I think move it into museums with explanations about you know, who these people were and what the war was about. The main problem uh, with most of them is their location. They were put in front of, on the public square, in front of government buildings, uh, many times put in front of courthouses, as simply as a symbol of the Old South and kind of a lesson uh, to minorities that, hey, the, the whites are supreme here. It was a really uh, something to 
and reinforce white supremacy. Mm -hmm. Okay, another question is, um, I'm not quite sure the context of when this came in, um, but the question is, is this correct? The army is against the renaming. Well, yeah, well, it's, but at this point, uh, is my understanding, and my have changed recently, uh, is that they have said they will, yeah, at this point, they, when, when there was this big uh, uproar after Charlottesville, they said, uh, no, at this point, we're not going to change the names. You know, how much they, I don't know who exactly who made that decision, but at that point, they said they were not going to change the names. I know that uh, when President Trump was in office, he uh, very emphatically said these names will not be changed. What's happening behind the scenes now, I'm not so sure. But again, I, I don't know how everybody else feels. I find that pretty incredible. Mm -hmm. We've got military bases named after generals uh, or military people who fought against the United States. I can uh, question that. Uh, it's not in chat. So I understand it, and I'm not, no way am I ever defending slavery. It's a, it's a, it's a despicable institution. But during the buildup of World War II, with a lot of army posts historically or traditionally named after generals, they, you know, the army probably 20 times, isn't that part of possibly part of the reason why they were just coming up with any American general, you know, to just name these new bases. And also again, solidarity, we're all one country. Is that possibly part of why they, a lot of the bases in the World War II buildup were named after Southern generals? Well, again, I don't know exactly who made that decision, but isn't it interesting, all the ones the number named after Southern generals are in the South. And once again, I would suggest uh, there are plenty of other generals, military leaders uh, who serve this country very well, and they do not have forts named after them. I mean, the other fact of it is, if you look at these names on these forts, many of these, they were, they were not good generals. They were not good military leaders. If you, even the South has is, is kind of said, hey, this guy wasn't so good. Uh, so to me, it's, it's never made any sense. And again, I think the critical issue here is these generals led forces fighting against the United States. Bob, we have three questions, which are all basically the same thing. Um, they're wanting to have a list of the reference books you suggested. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you and have I, a list like that? I, if I you... do, I, and I apologize. I should have uh, sent that to you uh, before this. Okay, I, well, I can send can... it. To yeah, if I you can, can send, send to you, Elise, and you can. Yeah, that'd be fine. And it's a list. This part three that I did, there are actually two parts to it. I just showed the first part here. So it'll include a lot of the uh, sources and suggested reading from some of the uh, later questions I used too, but everything's included in there. I referred to two of them I thought were very good that Confederates in the Attic uh, by Tony Horwitz. I don't know how, how many of you have read that. It's a little dated. It came out about 20, 25 years ago, but I think it's really well done. And the other is um, uh, Edward Baptist's book, um, The Half Has Never Been Told. Uh, I, I got familiar with that actually, because Baptist, this was several years ago, was at the Tucson Festival of Books. I had never heard of the book or anything. And it's an excellent depiction of the economics that really drove slavery. The economics of slavery were, just, I think were the main force of why the South had slaves and the North didn't. I don't think there was much difference in terms of racist feelings, but the economics were just incredible. Um, Shirley has made a comment regarding that discussion about um, bases and yeah. in the South and so forth. And her comment is, I believe they were named after Southern generals because there's a military tradition in the South. Um, well, while we're waiting for a couple yeah. other questions yeah. to come in. I wanted yeah. to make a couple comments myself. I lived yeah. in Nashville and I'm really familiar with that particular statue which oh. you showed of Nathan Bedford Forrest. This yeah. was highly controversial when yeah. it was um, being built and placed there. It's on I-65. You cannot miss this. And it's before you get into Nashville um, the, the problem with it is it's on private ground and a mm -hmm. private individual paid for this statue to be put up and literally no one could do anything about it because it's, yeah. you know, his private property. And it right. was 
highly controversial for quite a time, um, but there it is. Every once in a while, someone will jump the fence that is surrounding that. I'm not, they haven't defaced it yet, but they will put some interesting things hanging from the horse or Nathan Bedford Forrest yeah. um, and so forth. Um, and the other comment I had was regarding the Ku Klux Klan, it was started in Tennessee on Christmas Eve, 1865 in Pulaski, Tennessee, um, which uh, Nathan Bedford Forrest has roots in Pulaski and connections in Pulaski. Um, but the, the view is that when the Ku Klux Klan turned violent, um, he was against that and he resigned. Mm -hmm. So there we are. Um, let's see. Mark has made a comment that the recent book on Frederick Douglass follows the history of the USA after the Civil War very well. Yeah, that's another book. I'd hi I've, I've done that when I did a, a presentation on Reconstruction at other places. And yeah, that book is fantastic. It just came out a few years ago and very, very good. I think David Blight is just an excellent historian. Great. Well, this was a wonderful, amazing presentation. And we're just so grateful to you, Bob, with all of your, the work that went into this and the videos and all. I want to turn this back to John Ferno, who has some other things to say to all of us. Thanks, Elise. And uh, thanks to Bob for another excellent presentation and a very timely and I think straightforward and frank discussion of uh, issues that are difficult and uh, we're all dealing with as a country. So uh, appreciate the uh, time and effort put in. And uh, I think Bob is another great example of the talent and uh, experiences and abilities we have present in our organization uh, among the membership. So uh, like we mentioned, we're wrapping up this year and we're looking forward to building our uh, presentation schedule for next year. So I'm sure there's a lot of you that have the ability to do a good presentation and uh, encourage you to do so. Like I've mentioned before, if you haven't done it, you'll, I think you'll find it's an enjoyable experience. You'll learn a lot in doing it. Um, you'll learn a lot about your subject matter while, while you're doing it. So, you know, I'd encourage any of you that are interested in doing it. If you need help on presentations, uh, you know, the Zoom or if we're still doing Zoom, which we're likely to be doing in the beginning of next year anyway, uh, 